So um, just to remind you, this is the lecture on semantics of advanced data types. And here's the course outline with some green checks indicating the things that we've done. So on, mon on Monday, we talked about syntax and semantics of ADTs and nested types. And then yesterday, we talked about syntax and semantics of GADTs. And as promised, in this lecture, I'm going to um, talk about parametricity for ADTs and nested types. So in other words, we want to look at these data types through the lens of parametricity. And then next time, we'll do the same thing for GADTs. And um, I think I've said before, but I will spill the beans just a little bit again and say that the reason I split things up this way, like ADTs and nested types kind of lumped together and then GADTs separately, is because um, just as the syntax and semantics of ADTs and nested types behave similarly and GADTs behave somewhat differently, we're gonna see the same thing when we look at um, both of these through the um, lens of parametricity. So um, to start this lecture, uh, we could ask this question, can advanced data types be included in languages that otherwise would support parametricity? So I mean, like maybe system F. That would be a good example. So if you're not familiar with parametricity, um, it was introduced by John Reynolds and it was introduced to model this idea of type uniformity or representation independence um, in functional languages. So he developed parametricity for system F and of course it's um, now been extended um, to many, um, many extensions of system F. Um, if I started naming uh, various extensions, it would probably take me the entire length of this lecture, so I won't. I'll just say that um, parametricity is well studied for um, many systems other than system F. But what it tries to do is formalize this intuition that if you have a polymorphic program, so if you have polymorphic types and you have a polymorphic program, then that program has to act uniformly on all of its possible type instantiations. Okay, so I'm just trying to kind of lay out the, um, the scope of what we're going to talk about today. And of course, I'll go into all of this in, in more detail. So parametricity requires, if you're trying to formalize it, that every polymorphic program preserves all relations between pairs of types at which it's instantiated. So the idea is that related inputs should go to related outputs. That's a way to think about um, what parametricity is saying. So that was um, in the early 70s, uh, early 80s. And then um, in 89, Wadler came along and he sort of popularized this idea of parametricity as theorems for free. And the for free part means that parametricity can be used to deduce properties of programs just from their types. So you don't have to actually know anything about the text of the program. All you have to know is its type. Okay, and so um, he sort of phrased it as a, a kind of clever party trick, I guess, right? You can walk up to someone at a party and say, hey, give me the type of a, of a polymorphic program and I'll tell you a theorem it satisfies. And some unsuspecting person does that and he can tell them a theorem, okay? He only considered, if we're thinking about data types, he only considered lists explicitly in his paper and implicitly other ADTs. And most of the theorems that he gives, most of the free theorems he gives are actually consequences of naturality. Remember those naturality squares that we had yesterday? Well, they're, um, the theorems that he gives are basically instantiations of those kinds of naturality squares. He didn't really distinguish between sort of naturality consequences of parametricity and other ones. There wasn't any need to. So for ADTs, these coincide. I mean, there's no, there's no um, reason to distinguish between them because ADTs have, um, they have functorial semantics. So if you have ADTs, you give them this nice functorial semantics, you have these maps, you get these naturality properties like we talked about last time. So there was no real need to, to call out a difference. And similarly, um, for nested types, there isn't really a need to call out a difference. But you can probably imagine where this is gonna go next time, right? That for GADTs, the situation will be a little bit different. Okay, so let's, um, let's just try to back up a little bit and think about what's going on. So again, this is just trying to give you a, um, a general sense of, of where we're going. I am gonna talk about parametricity, about what it is, about how you formalize it. 
I'll do all of this at a, at a kind of a high level. There are pointers to papers that you can read um, on my website um, where it says uh, materials for OPLSS. But um, I do wanna give you a sense of, of what's going on here. Okay, so what we can say is that if you have, if your language has polymorphism, so I'm thinking in the functional programming sense, but maybe in other senses too, then you, know, you could say that polymorphic functions are actually really general um, because they can be applied to any types whatsoever. So that makes them seem really good. On the other hand, polymorphic functions have to work for um, all types. So they can't use um, or perform type specific operations, okay? And in that sense, polymorphic functions really aren't very general at all. So there's a kind of tension between them being general because they can be instantiated to any types, but on the other hand, um, they aren't very general because they can't use any type specific operations. But this last thing means that there are constraints on the types, um, on the kinds of functions that you can have. This, these um, polymorphic types put constraints on the functions. And what it means is that you can actually tell a lot about polymorphic functions just by knowing their types and without knowing anything at all about their definitions. Okay, so um, maybe that's a little bit surprising or maybe it's something very familiar. Um, I, I know that there are a whole bunch of people here and everybody has a, a different kind of uh, background, but, um, but this, is, this is the key observation. So all we're gonna try and do with parametricity is just make this really precise. So to do that, I'm first gonna start off talking about parametricity informally. So if I were to take a function like the standard filter function on lists, it takes a predicate and a list and gives me a new list. It has this nice polymorphic type. And I'm just gonna um, talk a little bit about um, what this type tells me about filter. So one thing we know is that if filter is the real filter function on lists, like the real one, then it will satisfy this property, right? This is, if, if you've taken a functional programming class, this is probably some exercise that you will have been asked to, to prove at some point. So this says, if I first map a function down a list and then filter the results by my predicate P, that's the same, I get the same thing as if I first filtered the list by P composed F and then mapped F over the results. Okay, so if filter is the real filter function, this is a theorem that holds for it. But the upshot of parametricity is that even without knowing that filter is the real filter function on lists, the fact that it has this polymorphic type means that it's gonna satisfy exactly the same theorem. So this is an example of a theorem for free or a free theorem, um, and we get it just from the type. Okay, so let's see how that works. Again, this is an informal description. Later on, we'll see this in a more formal way, but let's see it informally. So here's my filter function and which I'm calling it filter still, but of course um, we're thinking about any function that has this type, right? So even when I say filter, you should be maybe thinking like something purporting to be filter, you know, pretend filter or fake filter or something. So you have this function that has this particular type and we know it has to work uniformly on all the different instantiations of A. So that means that the output can only contain elements from the input list. They're the only, it's the only thing I've got, right? That's gonna be uniform over the, all the instantiations of A. So which elements you pick in which order and with which multiplicity can only be decided based on the um, input list and maybe the results of the predicate. That's it, that's, that's all you have. And those things can only be decided based on the length of the input list and on the results of applying the predicate to the elements of that input list. Okay, so now we're just gonna make the observation that if I have two lists like map FX's and X's, they're always gonna have the same length right? Because that's what map for list does. It just marches down the list and applies F to everything in the list. So these lists are always going to have the same length. And we'll also observe that if I apply a predicate 
to an element of map FXs, that's going to be exactly the same thing. Um, it's going to have the same outcome as applying P composed F to the corresponding elements um, of Xs. So that means that if I think about this function that I'm calling filter, filter P, it's going to choose the same elements from map FXs to output as this filter P compose F is going to choose from Xs. Well, except that I still have to apply F um, to the results to get the same output. And, and what I've said in words here is exactly that if I want to map F down a list X's and then filter the result by P, it's, I will get exactly the same thing if I were to filter X's by P composed F and then remember that I have to apply F to the results. Okay, so I just use this kind of um, informal reasoning about um, the type uniformity, right? I, I can't, I basically all these, these bullet points are saying, well, you know, you can't really use um, any type specific information. So you're really constrained. You can only look at like the elements of the list, the, the results of, of applying the predicate to the elements of the list, like the length of the list. You can only look at things that are type independent. And so um, this is um, a free theorem and it, doesn't just follow from the fact that list can be um, interpreted as a fixed point of a higher order functor. It uses, um, right, because this isn't a naturality. This isn't the kind of type you would get like from a naturality square. I mean, if I fixed my predicate, this would just be a polymorphic function between data types. And that could look like a, um, that could look like a, um, a naturality square. But this one, with filter when it takes a predicate too, it doesn't. So this is a little bit um, richer than the kinds of things we were talking about um, last time. Or another way to say this is that this is a free theorem that is not just a consequence of naturality. Okay, so some questions that we might try to ask are, how can we formalize this intuition, right? That was just an intuitive um, argument. So how can we formalize it? And an answer is, well, by constructing a parametric model for calculi that in which um, algebraic data types have a functorial semantics. I need a functorial semantics because the theorem involves map, right? So I have to have maps, which means I have to have um, functorial semantics like we talked about for the last two days. Okay, so that's um, one question. What other kinds of free theorems do parametric models give? Like that might be something we'd wanna know. And there are a whole bunch of different kinds. They can give um, type and habitation results. So for example, if you're in just straight up system F, the only inhabitant of this polymorphic type is the polymorphic identity and bottom. You get that from the way that the model is constructed. Um, you can use uh, parametricity results to enforce abstraction barriers, meaning that classes are really abstract in the sense that a, um, a client can't distinguish between different implementations of an interface. You can um, use parametricity to enforce program invariants, like invariants ensuring privacy, security, correct compilation, various things like that. There are lots of um, lots and lots of applications of parametricity. And you can prove that certain kinds of program transformations are correct. So for example, the free theorem for this polymorphic type gives a transformation that can turn a standard quadratic reverse function into a linear one. So you can get um, lots of um, interesting results just from this kind of type independence. Another thing you might ask is, well, can we construct a parametric model in which nested types have functorial semantics? And the answer is yes. And there's a pointer to a paper that um, is on my personal website. And um, I can't remember if I linked it in the um, materials for OPLSS, but I think I did. So yes. So here I was only talking about ADTs. Here I'm talking about nested types. And you might wonder, can you construct a parametric model in which GADTs have functorial semantics? And here the answer is a little bit more interesting. No, at least not if you're thinking of parametric semantics in the traditional way. Um, that will be something we'll talk about in the next and last lecture. 
Um, and maybe I should also say that um, I don't know how to do this if you, I don't know of any kind of semantics, um, any kind of parametric semantics for GADTs right now. Okay, so this is an open question. It's something I'm actively working on. And um, Daniel, who's monitoring the chat, is um, also involved in this work. Okay, so some interesting questions and a, a promise for a, an interesting answer next time. Okay, I'm so sorry. Um, yeah. Can we step back a bit? Um, in this uh, signature for this function, proven correctness of program transformations. This one? Yeah. And there, a argument missing somewhere. I'm sorry? Kinda. Is a. there an argument of type A missing somewhere? There's an A right there. Yeah, but it's only the function that we give to this function takes A and we can give it A from anywhere because we're yeah. not. I think the question is, is there a typo that A is missing after the bracket A? goes to B goes to B. Should there be an A after that in the outmost? Is that right? No, I don't think so. I think this is right. Okay. So A or B or B, A or B or B. So just think if B were um, list A, then this would be the type of cons. This would be the type of nil. And this would be the type list A. So this is like, um, you can kind of think of it as building up abstract lists. Um, another question. So uh, it, it says uh, the only inhabitants of type A to A are polymorphic identity function and the bottom. Can you specify what the bottom is? Well, it's just the function that always, that doesn't ever terminate, right? No matter what you give it, it just goes off into an infinite loop. But I'm just trying to, I'm not um, giving you details here. This is again, very high level. What I'm trying to do is to um, convince you that parametricity is interesting just in its own right. Um, and I'm just trying to give you a hint of some of the kinds of, of things that you can do with it. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, all right. Um, so I had some questions, but you had more. <laughs> so um, how do you formalize parametricity? So I've kind of talked about it in an informal way, but how do you, how do you make this stuff formal? How, do you, how would you actually construct a parametric model that you could use to derive the kinds of results that um, we were just talking about on the previous slide? Well, in general, what you do is you look at your calculus, the types and the terms, and you give two interpretations for your calculus, okay? So in particular, they're gonna give two interpretations for every type in the calculus. So including any, data, any fancy data types that you have. So if you have nested types or ADTs or GADTs, you're gonna give um, two different semantics. One of them is going to be in the category set that we talked about last time. So you're going to interpret your types um, with respect to sets. And another thing that you might do is, that you will do, is interpret your types with respect to relations. And this makes sense because remember the idea intuitively underlying parametricity is that related input should go to related outputs. So you should preserve all these relations. So you should give your, um, you should give your calculus, you should give the types of your calculus an interpretation in terms of sets and you should give it a, um, an interpretation in terms of relations. So um, this is just kind of a high level description again, because I like to try to give you an idea of what's going on and then maybe dig, drill down a little bit. So if you have a type that has a T that has one free variable A, you're gonna give it a set interpretation, which I'm gonna call T zero, that takes um, sets to sets in the way that we've already discussed for the last couple of days. You'll also give it a relational interpretation so I'm gonna call that T1 and it will take relations to relations, okay? And what it will do is if you had a relation R going from A to B, then T1 of R, the relational interpretation of T1, where you instantiate your type variable by 
a re this relation R, is going to give you a new relation, not just between any old input and any old output, but between um, the result of applying the set interpretation to A and the set interpretation to B. So a relation is going to be between sets so that this actually makes sense, right? T0 is something that should take a set and give me a set. So phew, I've got a set there, that's great. And similarly here. Okay. So and, you're gonna give, uh, yeah. Meaning that R, R is all the relations from A to any B? No, meaning or... that R is a particular relation that has domain A and codomain B. So if you give me a relation R between A and B, then T1 of R should be a new relation. What should its domain be? It should be T0 of A. And what should its codomain be? It should be T0 of B. Yeah, that's understandable. Okay. I mean, actually both A and B are arbitrary in this realm. Well, not after you fix R. <laughs> so in some sense, R is arbitrary. Yeah, right. A and, B, A and B are also sets, right? A and B have to be sets. A relation is going to be between sets. Yes, obviously. Right. Thanks. Okay. I mean, I haven't like given you details here. I'm just trying to, again, sort of tell you roughly what's happening. Hmm. Okay. And then we'll drill down a little bit. Okay. But yeah, so you're going to have these, these two different um, interpretations, a set interpretation and a relation interpretation. The uh, the A in the rel AB, is it the same as the A in the T square bracket A? Well, no, because this is a piece of syntax. So right. just uh -huh. as in... Yeah, yeah. Nice. Okay. Yeah, that was confusing. Yes. Okay, I'm, I, maybe I should have used something else. <laughs> notationally, in a lecture, notationally in a lecture, it's confusing, right? We're just trying to quickly... That's yeah, I know. It's a lot to digest, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, so I think with this stuff, um, maybe with maybe with all stuff, at least for me, um, I think the the thing to do is just try to um, get the overall picture. If you really want to dig into the details, yeah. there are papers that you can look at, right? Sure. Yeah, I've learned yeah. that. Yeah. Okay, but yeah, maybe I should use something other than a. That's a good point. <laughs> all right, so that's what's happening with the types: a set interpretation, a relational interpretation. What about the terms? Well, if you have a term and it has a free, vari a free type variable and a free term variable, and if the term has a type that depends on the type variable, and if the term variable also has a type that depends on the type variable, then you're going to associate um, to that term a set interpretation. What will it do? Well, if you give a set A, it should take the set interpretation of the type of the term variable at A to the set interpretation of the result type at A. So that looks like a lot, but let me just maybe try and say it a little bit um, more clearly. So T is a, um, is a term, it has a free variable X and X has some type F, with, might have some variables in it. So you can think of the, the term T as taking F things to T things, but you wanna do it um, in such a way that you're always aware of the type that you're at. So I think um, when you think about it that way, this isn't very surprising. And you also need a relational interpretation for your um, terms, but I don't need to talk about that right now. Okay, so again, it's like everything in your calculus, set interpretation, relational interpretation. Set interpretation, relational interpretation for types and terms. Okay, so how do you give them? You give them inductively on the structures of the types and the terms, and you do it in such a way that you get these two fundamental theorems. One is called an identity extension lemma, and it looks like this. And here's what it says. It says, if you look at the relational interpretation of your type, and you instantiate all the variables with equality relations, and just think of normal everyday equality relations, then what you should get is the same thing as if you 
were to um, take your the set interpretation of that type at the um, the underlying set of the equality relation, and you will just get equality. Um, you will just get an equality relation on those kinds of terms. So it says like if you take your if you take your type and you substitute all the um, all the type variables with equality relations and kind of propagate that up your type hierarchy, what you'll end up with is an equality relation. So that, that's what this Concrete is. example, please. Uh, concrete example would be helpful. No, I don't have a calculus. It, you can- a Concrete um, example, no, no, no. I mean, I don't have a way to write. Okay. But I also, um, I don't, I haven't given you a concrete calculus. I'm just trying to tell you what form, but what yeah. parametricity says. It yeah. says, if, so pick your favorite calculus that you think has a parametric model or look at some papers that use them or look at Wadler's paper or John Reynolds paper or any paper that talks about parametricity. If you have a type and you look at its relational interpretation and um, what you do is you interpret and interpret your type variables as equalities, then what will happen if you kind of propagate that up like through your whole type system, like maybe your type system has sums or maybe it has products or maybe it has arrow types or maybe it has whatevers. And um, you propagate that up in a way that I will describe momentarily, but I have not described yet, you will end up with an equality relation. Okay, so, so to make a parametric model, you have to satisfy this property. That's the point. And there's another property that you also have to satisfy which is an abstraction theorem, something called the abstraction theorem. So notice that the identity extension limb is only about the type interpretations. Now the abstraction theorem is gonna be about term interpretations as well. And it's gonna say something like this. Um, if I have a relation um, R between A and B, and I had my, um, my term with a free variable, free type variable and a free term variable, then if I look at the set interpretations of that term at this A and this B, that's gonna give me a morphism of relations between, so just ignore the first components, between F1 of R, because remember this X had type F, and T1 of R. So it's gonna map things that are related by the relational interpretation of X at R to things that are related by the relational interpretation of T at R. So this is the way that you formalize. If you, if you um, really unpack this, you'll see that this is how you formalize the idea that related inputs go to related outputs. Okay. And of course, there's nothing special here about having one free type variable and one free term variable. It's just that it becomes uh, notationally a bit cumbersome to talk about more. So um, I thought I would just try to um, try to save your heads a little bit and only talk about one explicitly. Okay. So what's the upshot of this slide? That um, to formalize parametricity, you give every type two interpretations, a set interpretation and a relational interpretation. You give every term a set interpretation and a relational interpretation. And you don't just get to do this any old way. To have a parametric model, I mean, to have a model, that will be fine. But to have a parametric model, you want to say that related things go to related things. So when you build your model, they should um, your model should satisfy this identity extension lemma property and this abstraction theorem. Okay, so that's the, um, the fundamental um, thing that you're trying to do when you're, when you're trying to uh, build a parametric model to show that you have these parametricity properties for a calculus that has, well, whatever it is that you think it has in it. Okay, so now we wanna um, get into um, trying to formalize this a little bit more. So here I wrote, um, I wrote some, some triples. Here I wrote a relation saying that R is a relation between A and B. And here I wrote some triple. I should probably have been more consistent and use the triple notation everywhere. So I'm going to write um, R colon rel AB 
for a triple that just says ABR. So in other words, when I write something like this, I'm saying the third component's a relation, its domain is the first component and its codomain is the second component, okay? So that's why when I look here, what I'm really saying is that if R is a relation between A and B, and I look at the set interpretation of my term T with the free, vari free type variable and the free term variable, and I look at it instantiated at the type A and I look at it instantiated at the type B, then I should map things related by the relational interpretation of the type of X to things related by the relational interpretation of T. Okay, all right. So, um, so to do all of, to do this, um, just like last time we gave um, interpretations of our, well, we were focusing on data types. So um, we gave relational interpretation, we gave interpretations of our data types in the category set, right? That sets and morphisms between them. Now we're gonna give um, our relational interpretations in this category rel. So I'm gonna tell you what this category is. So a relation, which is a triple, or sometimes, as you have seen, sometimes I write it like this, um, is given by a set A, a set B, and just a normal everyday ordinary relation on A and B. So this part should, this should be making your brain relax a little bit, right? This is really familiar, hopefully. What are the morphisms in this category? Well, if I, I want to have, um, a morphism between this relation and this relation, I should have used R2, um, then it will be a pair of morphisms in set where the first one goes between the domains, the second one goes between the codomains, right? That's what I've said here and here. And it will be such that if I have things that are related in the first relation, they will map to things that are related in the second relation in the codomain relation. So again, this is the idea that related things go to related things. The identity morphism is just what you think. It's the pair of the identities on set. Composition is just given component wise. So what I mean is if I wanted to compose two um, morphisms of relations like F1, G1 and F2, G2, I would just compose F1 and F2 and I would compose G1 and G2. So I would just do it component wise. So I have a category of relations. And what, we're, what we will see is that you can interpret um, constructors, type constructors like um, top, bottom, sums, products in rel whenever you can interpret them in set. And the same is true for fixed points. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about this on the next slide, but um, the category rel um, has the same kinds of properties that the category set has. So you can do the same kinds of constructions, same kinds of categorical constructions, take sums, takes products, et cetera. Um, have um, an, initial, an initial object, a terminal object. You can have all the same kinds of categorical structure um, in rel that you would have in set. And similarly, um, that means, well, that means that I can interpret type constructors in this essentially the same way in both categories. And I can do the same thing for fixed points, which is important because we're trying to look at data types that we see as fixed points. Okay. All right, so let's see how this goes. So um, I claim that interpretations of all of these construct these type constructors like bottom, top, sums, and products, that they're all gonna preserve relatedness and that the fixed point operator is gonna have exactly the same property. Okay, so how do I think about bottom? I'm just going to interpret that as the initial object in rel when I'm trying to make my relational interpretation. And what is that? Well, it's the initial object in set twice. So empty set, empty set, and then, an empty relation. So I've got the, I've written three empty items, <laughs> but the first, this one is an empty set, that one's an empty set, and this is um, the empty relation. So think of a relation as, of course, um, 
a, a subset of the product. So this is an empty set, but I'm thinking of it as an empty relation. Okay, so that's how I'm gonna think, that's how, how I'm going to interpret bottom. For top, I'm going to interpret it as, so one is the, um, I'm gonna write one for the terminal object and set. So I can think of it as the singleton set, they're all isomorphic. So I'm gonna just write one for that instead of writing a set with some randomly named element in it. Okay, so I'll take um, the, the terminal object of rel. So the way I'm gonna interpret this top is as one, one. So the terminal object in set, the terminal object in set, and then the relation that is total there on these, on this domain and codomain. How do I take the sum of two relations? Well, it's going to be, to be a relation over the sum of the domains and the sum of the codomains. And I'm just going to do exactly what you think, right? I'm going to um, look at all the things that are um, related in the first component and all the things that are related in the second component. And what about for products? The product of two relations is gonna be a new relation and it's going to be over the product of the domains and the product of the codomains. And it's going to relate two things exactly when the first components are related and the second components are related. Okay. So um, what you should notice here is that every time I want to do a, a kind of construction on um, in, in the, the category of relations, I end up with a re new relation that is over what I would get by doing the same exact construction, but at, at the level of sets, right? So um, the, the terminal relation is over the terminal, um, sorry, the initial relation, the initial object in rel is gonna be over the, the pair of initial objects in set. The terminal object in rel is gonna be over the pair of terminal objects in set. The sum of two relations, the sum in, of two things in rel is gonna be over the sums of, the, of two things in set and similarly for the products. Okay, so I have this kind of overness property, like anything I do at the level of relations is um, over the corresponding um, kind of construct at the level of sets for the domains and codomains. Okay, so another way to say that this is a kind of a long bullet point. Um, you get a rectangular, the rectangular kind of uh, uh, a commutative map for this kind of thing also. Uh, can you can you say that again, please? Uh, is, I think it's called natural transformation, right? Can you get a natural transformation for this? Uh, um, I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to talk about um, anything like that right now. Okay. Um, if you're thinking ahead, um, depending on what you mean by your question, the answer might be yes. Okay, fair enough. Fair <laughs> but enough. right now, I'm just trying to tell you. Um, you know, I've got I've got this syntax, right? I've got this language. I've got some types. I've got some terms. Mm. And we're trying to build a model, and we're trying to build a model in such a way that um, the model's gonna. Um, verify the fact that the sin, the, that um, related things will go to related things. So I have to build a model in this category, Rel. Okay. okay. All right. So um, what I'm, so again, this kind of overness property is, is really critical. So what we're saying is that like a product in, product in Rel is over products in set and a sum in Rel is over sums in sets. And um, another way to say that, a, a kind of more formal, more technical way to say that is to say that each of these constructors makes what's called a relation transformer. So the next two slides are gonna be pretty technical. There's no way that you'd be able to digest all of this. Well, maybe you can, but um, I, I will be, like I say, really impressed if you can um, digest it all in real time. But here's the idea. So in set, we, we think of types as sets, we think of type constructors as functors. And then to end up with the maps, we wanted to look at higher order functors. So we wanted to look at functors on functors and we wanna look at their fixed points. We wanna do the analogous things in RHEL. So we wanna interpret our types as relations, 
are type constructors, not as functors, but as something called relation transformers. It's kind of the analog of functors. And then we're gonna take fixed points of functors on relation transformers. So all I'm trying to do is set things up so that um, everything that I do in set, everything that we talked about for the last couple of days, um, when you are taking a, um, trying to build a, a set model can be done at the level of relations. Okay, so our sets are, our um, types are interpreted as relations in the relation model. And our type constructors are gonna be interpreted as relation transformers. And so I have to tell you what a relation transformer is and I'm gonna do it really quickly. So it just says, um, it's gonna be a triple of two functors in set and um, a functor on relations. And they're gonna have the property that if I take, if I feed related things as input, I'm gonna get related things as output. So in other words, if I have a whole bunch of relations interpreting the, um, the variab free variables in my type, and I look at what happens at the relation level, I'm gonna get a relation that looks at the set functors, the corresponding set functors on the domains and codomains. So again, I've kind of got this like overness property. The technical term for that is, is you would say that the interpretation is fibered, okay? If, if that's a term that you're familiar with, but I can just think of it as overness and similarly for morphisms. So now I've got these relation transformers. And again, like in set, I've got sets and functors. And over here, I've got relations and relation transformers. And what we wanted to do, remember, is to think of our functors as fixed points of higher order functors over here in set. So over here, I want to make functors on relation transformers. Okay, a lot of details, but um, these relation transformers also form a category. The objects are relation transformers. Morphisms are some pairs of natural transformations. It doesn't matter. The important point is that um, they form a category and that we can um, say what the identities and composition are. So I'm just doing all the, um, all the analogous stuff at the level of relations. Um, so I have a, have a category. So then I can talk about functors on this category. And those, um, are again, are just kind of like the relational analog of what we did at the level of sets. So again, sets, functors, um, functors on functors, relations, um, re relation transformers, functors on relation transformers. And a functor on a relation transformer is just some, some functors. So the, the domains and codomains are some functors. Um, I end up the third component is gonna be a functor that goes, that's on relation transformers, cause that's like being a functor on functors, but at the relation level, they have to satisfy some nice kind of coherence properties. There are a whole bunch of them. I even actually just wrote down here, many coherence conditions hold. So everything should kind of line up nicely with this kind of overness idea. Okay. And if you do that, then you can actually take the fixed point of one of these functors um, on the category of relation transformers, and we can write down like a really concrete way in which to do it. But the critical thing to notice here is that if I want to take the fixed point of um, a functor on a relation transformer, of course, I'm going to get relation transformer. And the third component is going to be some crazy thing. But, but check it out, it's gonna be over the fixed point of the first component and the fixed point of the second component. So again, I've kind of got this overness idea, this overness idea. So the fixed point of a functor on relation transformers is going to be over the fixed point of a functor, like a real, um, a real functor, higher order functor, a real functor on set. So one for the domain and one for the codomain. So again, I kind of, I have a relation transformer because um, what I'm doing at the level of relations is 
over or reflected by what's going on um, at the level of sets, at the level of the domain and the codomain, which are sets or which are in set. Okay, so I have this, I have this way where I'm kind of mirroring everything I do in set at the relation level. We have a question in the chat. Okay. Uh, Carlos asked, what happens if you uh, follow the story for ADTs and just take functors on rel instead of relation transformers? Um, you, it just collapses back to the, um, to, so as, um, let's see, how do I say this? Um, yeah, everything just will collapse back. So the, the ADT case is just um, exactly the special case of this when you're talking about um, relations. So another way to say it is that a zero area, a, a zero area relation transformer is just a relation. So everything just collapses back down. So I don't get something weird if I think of um, zero, area, zero area relation transformers or unary relation transformers or something. I don't get something weird and, and a di completely different semantics for ADTs. I just get the same semantics as before. Yes, thanks. <laughs> Good telling, he's welcome. <laughs> Okay, so after all of that, if you do all that stuff that I just mentioned, which I'm sure feels like a lot, you're going to end up in the place that you were maybe hoping to end up. So if I have um, a data type D, okay, let's say this is a type constructor for an ADT or a nested type. So um, it could be list or it could be P tree or C and uh, not seek P tree or Bush, something like that, okay? then the action of the relational interpretation on a bunch of relations is going to do exactly what you think and we're probably hoping it would do. It's good, what it's going to do is this. So remember that um, in a parametric model, if I look at that relational interpretation applied to a bunch of relations, I should get a new relation and it has to be over the set interpretation of my data type on the domain of domains of my relations and the set interpretation of my data type applied to the codomains, right? So that's all I've written here. Okay, so which relation? What's gonna happen? Well, if I take a D in the domain and a D prime in the codomain, they're gonna be related exactly when they have the same shape and every data element in the first data type is related by R to the corresponding element in the second data type. And this is probably where you were kind of hoping things would, would end up, right? Like if I said to you, I've got two lists, when, when should the two lists be related by, by you know, list applied to a relation, whatever, what should that mean? I hope what you would say to me is, well, it should mean the lists have the same length and it should mean that like element wise, the um, the data are related by by the relation, and that is exactly what this is saying, right? So I should have the same length. So for list, that means I should I'm sorry the same shape. So for list, that means I should have the same length. And this says, well, if I look at the data elements at corresponding positions, then they should be related by the relation that I'm trying to lift to the lists. So for example, here's a concrete example. So if I look at the list one, two, three, four, and the list five, six, seven, eight, I claim that they're related by the relation list P. So P should be a relation here. So this is the relational interpretation of list. And this is P is a relation. What relation is it? Well, it's the one whose domain is natural numbers and whose codomain is natural numbers. And I'm gonna say that two um, natural numbers are related exactly when they have the same parity. Okay. So these two lists are related by list P for this particular P, right? Because they have the same length, so they have the same shape. And one and five have the same parity, two and six have the same parity, three and seven, four and eight. Again, I'm not trying to suggest that this is um, a, a surprising definition. It's probably exactly what you would write down um, if, if someone just walked, as people do, walk up to you on the street and said, you know, um, what should it mean for, for two lists to be related? Okay, like what should, what relation should, 
list one of P B for some P or another way to ask that question would be, um, how do I, um, how do I, how does the relational interpretation of list convert a relation into a new relation? And probably you would say exactly this. Okay, but it comes from this um, very principled place and it's not principled just so that we can write down lots more symbols. It's principled because um, it allows us to, um, to build a model that works in the way in, that exactly validates the things that, that we would think of intuitively, but we don't have to rely on intuition, right? Because when your intuition breaks down, that's when all the really cool stuff starts happening. And we're gonna see next time that things really do break down for GADTs. So I have to kind of show you um, how we set things up um, and why it's reasonable to set things up this way, how it gives you what you expect intuitively and then show you why that kind of fails for GADTs next time. Okay, so anyway, let's have another concrete example. So suppose I looked at um, a couple of binary trees from this tree type that we had last time. Then I claimed that this tree and this tree um, are related by the relation, well, the, it's the relational interpretation of tree applied to, I, now I need two relations, right? One, one for A and one for B, because remember these were trees with um, A data at the leaves and B data at the nodes. So I have to give you a relation for A data and B data. So for the A data, the leaf data, um, I'm going to use the same P, this parity relation. And for the node data, I'm gonna use just the standard ordering on bool. Okay, and that makes sense because they have the same shape, right? And component wise or like data wise, the same things in the same shape are related by these relations. So one and seven have the same parity, false is less or equal to true, two and eight have the same parity, true is less or equal to true, and three and nine have the same parity. And similarly, if I had a couple of perfect trees, so these are nest, these are ADTs, but now if I had a nested type, I would say that these two um, perfect trees are related by the relation, um, well, what should it be? It should say, I should look at it, I should look at um, two different perfect trees and I should say that they're related when they have the same shapes and when element wise, um, the data is related by the relation that I'm, interested in, and in this case, I'm just gonna use less than. So one is less than five, two is less than six, three is less than seven, and four is less than eight. So again, exactly what I hope you would write down if someone said, well, how should I think about um, this data type as a relation? I think you would say exactly this. Okay, so we have set interpretations and relational interpretations for ADTs and nested types, and I'm not going to show it, I didn't show, but you can also make a term calculus and it's set in relational semantics in such a way that you end up with a parametric model. In other words, that identity extension lemma that we saw before holds and also the abstraction theorem holds. And I've just kind of reminded you what, what those say here. The identity extension lemma is about propagating equalities. The abstraction theorem is, um, is about related things going to related things. So you can, um, with, with the type interpretations I just told you about, you can build um, an, a set in relational interpretations for the terms of a calculus, like maybe let's say system F or something um, in such a way that these two properties hold so you can have a parametric model. All right, so um, great. So we have a parametric model. These are supposed to give us some free theorems. So let's see a free theorem please, right? Maybe that's what you're thinking. So let's see one. So consider the flattened function that takes perfect trees to lists. What the abstraction theorem tells us is that if I pick any relation R between A and B, then the set interpretation of flatten at A and the set interpretation of flatten at B are related in this interpretation, but where now I'm looking at the relational interpretation of P tree and the relational interpretation of list. So uh, what I wanna do is unpack this. This is what I've done in the bullet point that I'm kind of circling around is I've just instantiated um, the abstraction theorem for this particular function. Now I wanna unpack that a little bit. So what it says is that if P and P prime are perfect trees of the same shape 
and if they have R related data in corresponding positions, then if I flatten P and flatten P prime, I will get court, I will get lists with the same lengths and R related data in corresponding positions. That's intuitively what it says. The way that you prove this using parametricity is you say, well, um, I'm for the relation, I'm going to take the graph of my function f that I'm interested um, in, uh, in mapping. And what the conditions say is that, so this one says that um, it's coding up this, that if P and P prime are perfect trees with the same shape, and if P and P prime have R related data in corresponding positions. So that means if I were to map my function over P, I would get P prime. That's what it would mean for them to have corresponding data and corresponding positions. Then the same thing happens for the results. So if I map my function over the first thing in the pair, I should get the second thing in the pair. Okay, so another way to, um, to see that is to inline this P prime. Well, it's map FP. So the left side is still exactly this. And the right side looks exactly like this. And notice that this is exactly the semantic equivalent of that naturality property that we had from lecture one, right? We had, um, we said, you know, if you want to, um, if you want to map a function across a perfect tree and then flatten it into a list, that's the same thing as if you were to flatten the tree first and then map the function. Okay, so this is the theorem that we saw um, the syntactic equivalent of in lecture one. And if I just, again, kind of reflect this back into syntax and now I'm going to elide the, the type applications, I get exactly that theorem that we had before. So this is um, a result that we can get from parametricity, but we can also get it just from naturality, right? Because we got it in lecture one before I'd ever said the word parametricity. Okay. And I've already told you the abstraction theorem can prove lots of other results, not just naturality results, but other kinds too. So maybe let's um, have a peek at, at one. Okay, so remember our, um, our filter theorem from earlier today, the one that I argued informally um, based on filters type. And we know that it doesn't really matter um, that the function is the real filter function or not. We just know that if I have a function that has filters type, then um, it should satisfy um, a particular property, right? Um, I argued that informally, and now I'm gonna argue it um, using this parametricity result that, um, that we've been talking about. So you can kind of see how it follows. It, the, the format is exactly the same as this. You're going to derive the results in, in, in the analogous way here. But I think it might be helpful to see it. How do you take that informal argument that we made at the very beginning of the lecture today? And how do you make that um, more precise, right? How do you make it formal? So suppose I have a function that has filters type. So notice um, I, I say the free theorem for filters type, not the free theorem for filter because again, it doesn't matter if it's filter or not. So um, let me look at a function that has filters type. The abstraction theorem tells me that if I have a relation between A and B, then the set interpretation of filter at A and the set interpretation of filter at B are related at the type I get. And so now I have to um, interpret this thing at the relational level. Okay, well, we've already seen that the codomain is gonna be the relational interpretation of list at my R and similarly for this list. Here, I'm going to take, um, I'm going to interpret my um, free variable as a relation now. And the way that I interpret constant, um, like just, you know, constant types, just uh, primitive types, I guess I should say, is I just am going to interpret them as an equality relation on that type. So I have to interpret them as some relation. And the most kind of obvious one is to use the equality relation. There are settings in which you might want to use something else, 
like if you're trying to use parametricity to, um, to prove some approximation theorems or something, then you might have some approximation ordering on a primitive type. But for here, um, we'll just talk about, um, we'll just think of our, of our relations um, that interpret um, primitive types as being equality relations. Okay, so um, what I should have is that the set interpretation of, of this function at A and the set interpretation of the function at B are going to be related in, in this relation. So how do I unpack that? I'm gonna do the same thing I did before. I mean, this is actually very similar to what we had before. The only thing that's different is I've got this kind of functional relation thing here. So as before, I'm going to um, just take my relation to be the graph of some function. This is a really common thing to do. You don't have to do it. You can take an arbitrary relation, but it's very common to instantiate your relation to be the graph of a function. So I'm gonna do that. So now what this says is, well, let's unpack this piece. So this is supposed to be a function between relations. And remember that means that I should take related things to related things. So it's saying that if P and P prime are such that if I have a Y and a Y prime that are related in this relation, that is to say, if map F of Y is Y prime, if whenever that happens, that implies that P of Y and P prime of Y are related in this relation, which is an equality relation. So I've just written it as equals. Okay, and if I had two lists X and X prime, that have the same length and that have related data at related elements. Well, that is the same thing as saying that if I map F over the first list, I get the second. Then if I'm, um, then the results are gonna be related in the same, same kind of relation. So if I look at the first, ele the first um, element of the pair here and the second element of the pair here applied to P's and X's, then they should be related in this relation. And for R being the graph of the function, what that means is that if I map F over the first one, I will get the second one. It's exactly the same thing it meant here. Okay, well, just kind of unpacking this first bit a little bit, it says that if P of Y is P prime of map F Y, right? because now my y prime is map fy. So if py is p prime of map fy, then, and now I'm gonna inline this piece, then map f filter px's is filter p prime, and I've just substituted in for x prime, x's prime. Simplifying a little bit more, um, I'm gonna notice that P prime of map of F of Y. Well, I mean, this Y, it doesn't really have any structure. So that's really just P prime of F of Y. And I have the same conclusion. So this is saying P prime of Y is P prime composed F at Y. And all I've done here in this last piece is get rid of the hypothesis, but notice that P is P prime composed F. So I've got map F filter, P, which is P prime composed F, X's is filter P prime map F X's. And this is the, um, that kind of non-naturality theorem that I argued was correct at the beginning of the lecture today. Okay, so we saw it informally and I hope that the informal description made sense, but here we're seeing it formally as a result of parametricity because we've set things up um, in such a way that we end up with a parametric model and we can prove this abstraction theorem, which is the place that this proof is starting. We can prove some fancier things. I actually think I won't go through this one, but um, if you're familiar with this um, theorem, this program transformation called shortcut fusion, then um, we can prove shortcut fusion is correct also using parametricity. So if I have, let's say a fold for lists, this is just the, normal, boring, everyday, ordinary standard fold. Then I have a theorem for that G that was in the beginning um, that um, someone was asking about 
someone was asking me if I had a typo. And actually, I, I noticed now that I've swapped the order of the first and second arguments, but of course it's isomorphic. Um, but other than that, um, if I look at that type, and if I have um, an N that has some type T prime, so it's like an, I think of this as being like an abstract nil, and a C that has a type that means that it's like an abstract cons, then here's the following theorem holds. If I take this kind of abstract list making function and I apply it to real life nil and real life cons, this should give me a real life list. And if I then fold with N and C over that list, I get the same thing as if I just took this abstract list making function and applied it to the abstract um, N and the abstract C. So this one, this left-hand side, is this piece is going to make an actual list and the fold is gonna come along and consume it because the third argument is a real list. And this side says, oh, you don't have to do that. You don't have to like make this list, allocate some cells in the heap, manipulate them, deallocate them, right? When, you're, when you fold over it, you can just kind of apply the function to the abstract, um, the abstract nil and the abstract cons directly. So it gives you a way to, um, to kind of cut out the construction of um, these, what they're called intermediate data structures. So if you know this paper um, about um, deforestation by Phil Wadler, that's what this is about because you're getting rid of tree-like data structures. Here you're getting rid of a list, but you can, there's a, um, a similar rule for any kind of, um, of ADT. And if you think of those as being tree-like, then you're getting, you're eliminating some trees, right? So deforesting and functional programming humor. Um, okay, I'm not responsible for the names. I'm just conveying them to you. <laughs> okay, all right. So, um, so anyway, um, I actually wrote the, um, I wrote the derivation here. So you'll have it in the slides, but I don't really think it's um, necessarily worth um, going through in real time. Okay, but you can get this by, um, by parametricity. And again, this is not a naturality style theorem. Okay. And not only that, but we actually have a similar kind of theorem for every ADT and every nested type. Okay, for nested types are a little bit more complicated because remember nested types are fixed points of higher order functors, not of first order functors. Um, so the folds look a little more complicated right? There's a little bit more quantification all over the place. Um, the type of the kind of abstract, um, this is for perfect trees. So the abstract perfect tree making function is again, going to be a little bit more complicated and the replacement functions for the constructors, like the, the abstract P leaf and the abstract P node are going to be a little bit more complicated, but it's, it's going to be the same. Um, it's exactly the same theorem. Okay, so you're gonna have the same kind of theorem. So now you're kind of cutting out a whole perfect tree. So again, deforesting. Okay, so that's what I wanna show you for today. So here's what we've seen. You can construct parametric models for languages that have um, ADTs and nested types. And I did not um, talk about all the details of that. Um, for ADTs, you can look at Phil Wadler's paper and that is um, on the resources linked off of my homepage. For nested types, you can look at a recent paper um, by me and Daniel, who's in monitoring the chat and um, my postdoc, um, Enrico Giorzi. And um, you can look at that paper. And I think I linked that as well. So we've seen that you can construct these models for ADTs and nested types. Um, we've seen how to use um, parametric models to derive naturality results and um, program transformations and some other um, non-naturality parametricity results. Um, I should maybe mention, um, I know there've been some questions in the, in the Slack channel about um, induction and you can see induction as unary parametricity. So parametricity, like we've been talking about binary relations. If you just thought of your relations as unary relations, in other words, predicates, then the exact same, um, then parametricity in that unary setting is exactly induction. 
So if you're trying to think like, hey, I've got these crazy data types, can I induct over them? It's like, well, can you build a parametric model? Okay. Um, so we've seen how, you know, you can do some kind of interesting things. We haven't seen in any detail, but there are lots of papers out there that show that. Um, so one thing you might naturally ask at this point is, can I do the same thing for GADTs? Like, can you get, you know, these naturality results? Can you get, is there a short confusion kind of rule for GADTs? Are, you know, are there other kinds of program transformations that, that follow from this uniformity that parametricity codes up? Um, can you get induction rules for them? And what we'll see next time is that, remember how we had these two different interpretations for GADTs, like the discrete one and the one in real, real non-real, <laughs> non-discrete categories? So if you think of your GADTs as being discrete, then you can, you can make a parametric model, but of course you don't have naturality theorems or interesting naturality theorems, right? Because the, there are, the maps are really boring because the only morphisms you have are identities. So not so interesting. So you can make a parametric model for, um, for a calculus like system F augmented with GADTs, but you're not gonna get very interesting naturality style theorems, but you can get the non-naturality style theorems and those might be of interest to you. Um, if you're looking at your GADTs as being kind of functorial, right? If you want your GADTs to have a functorial semantics, yeah, you can make set, relation, set interpretations, relational interpretations, but you're not going to be able to make a parametric model. And that's what I'm going to show you next time. Okay. And to kind of get ready for that, one thing you could ask yourself is if I have two GADTs, well, what, what should it mean for those to be related, right? So for lists, we said, if I have two lists, they should be related by some relation. Um, are I should be able to lift a relation up to list if the two lists have the same lengths and if kind of element wise the, the, um, they're related. And we said the same thing for like perfect trees or other nested, nested types. But what about for GADTs? I mean, that's a little bit strange because remember like GADTs can have constructors that, um, that only construct specific instances of the GADT. So if I have a if I have something that constructs, um, like if I had something that only constructed like sequences of ints, what would it mean to kind of talk about two GADTs made that way being having related data at related positions? I don't know. What does it even mean to have a position really, right? Because if I have a GADT and it and I'm looking at a um, a certain kind of um, a certain kind of element in that GADT. If I map over it, I might get something that I can't represent in syntax. So, what does that mean? But that's what we'll talk about next time. Right. So that's that's what I have for you for today. Thank you, Professor. Thank you for. Yeah. Um, Daniel, any questions? Uh, yeah, a couple of questions in the chat. Um, the first one is from Alex, and he asks, Alex, feel free to follow up if, if you need to, but it's, he says, is it the case that to instantiate the abstraction term for filter, um, we take uh, F, F A to be a arable times list A. Um, well, basically, his question is, does it matter that F uses A contravariantly? Uh, um, no, because remember, um, <laughs> remember, we were always um, very careful to make sure that our data types had underlying functors. And that is precisely to make sure that they have, um, that they have, you know, that, that they have maps, right? So, um, so we've, um, we've set up our data types in such a way that, um, that we don't have any, any of the kind of contravariance that would cause a problem. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then some more questions. Um, what's the relation between logical relation style models in the sense of Tate for SN and parametricity? 
Yeah, so um, basically what we are doing is making a logical relations model, but we're making sure that it um, that it satisfies um, these this identity extension lemma and uh, um, and the abstraction theorem. So the the um, the fundamental structure um, that you're using to interpret the types is indeed a logical relation, but then it has, should satisfy these extra properties. So um, yeah, it was the one who asked the question. Oh. Thanks for the answer. <laughs> uh, so uh, the but in the logical relations, you always have this abstraction theorem that is what they call the fundamental lemma, fundamental theorem, and so yeah. on. Mm -hmm. It's the same. So can we say the difference is the identity extension lemma? Yes. So what oh. you can say is that the identity extension lemma is like the thing that takes a um, like a logical relations model. Um, to a parametric model. Okay, thank you yeah, very much. You yeah. And then there's one more question in the chat. Um, they might need to clarify, but Guillermo asks, is the example uh, A arrow A equals unit type more difficult to prove? Um, I don't know what that means. I guess they're saying more difficult than the flatten example. Uh, a arrow a arrow unit. Uh, sorry, a arrow a equals unit. I get that free theorem that a arrow a uh, for all a oh, arrow oh, a. Oh. Right, right, right. Okay, so sorry. I'm now I'm with you. So you mean um, when I said this vague thing way back in the beginning, which I okay here. So you mean this this type? It's not any. It's not any harder. No. And you use the um, you use the abstraction theorem in exactly the same way as for the examples here. If you want to see that, you can look at um, you can you can look at a Reynolds original paper. Although I personally find that paper um, kind of hard to, to the notation. I think is not obvious. You um, I think it might also be proved in Phil Wadler's paper, the theorems for free paper, and that's probably an easier place to see it um, and from which to digest it. But it's not any harder than you know than the things we did wherever we did them. Now scrolling forward forever, it's not any harder than this. Uh, and one more question: um, What's the difference between functors on rel and a relation transformer? Well, a, um, a relation transformer plays the role of a, a functor on rel, so. Um, it's just that it, it needs a little bit more structure. Like I can't just say it's a functor on rel because some types won't, some types kind of won't match up. But but I mean, essentially you can think of it as a functor on relations. Yeah, I mean, that is exactly. So like, again, there's like sets in on set, you have, you interpret your types as sets and you have your type constructors are functors and then you have um, higher order functors. And over in relations, you've got rel and you've got relation transformers and then functors on relation transformers. So you know, exactly this, the analogous things. There's just some more, more a lot of bookkeeping details at, at the relation level, that's all. Okay, so thanks, and there are any other questions in the chat, uh, okay. unless I've missed anyone, in which case, please, please speak up. up. <laughs> all right, um, thanks, then see you tomorrow. <laughs>